thank you for coming tonight. It's a, a big night for us as it's our first um, lecture and gallery opening for the winter term. Um, this semester we are continuing the Sliver series in the theme of special effects. We are pleased to have Hernan Alonso Diaz with us tonight. We'll start with a short presentation by Hernan and then move towards a discussion format. Brennan Buck will talk with Hernan and incorporate questions that have been acquired from our student body. Following the lecture, please join us um, in the gallery for the opening of Technicolor Bloom, a full-scale installation led by Brennan Buck with Rob Henderson and a small group of students. Hernan Alonso Diaz is a provocative and influential designer that is blazing new territory and challenging our notion of beauty and aesthetics. He evokes intense conversations among his peers and students and perpetuates a healthy discourse in contemporary architecture. As principal and founder of Zerfotarf, a design firm focusing on architecture, products, and digital motion based in Los Angeles, and a prolific and dedicated professor, he oscillates between practice and academia, gaining knowledge and gaining knowledge from both realms. He's currently teaching at SIRE in Columbia, and we are happy to have him here this semester as a visiting professor. His work focuses on an obsession and appreciation for, for the perversity of mutant form. His work method is closely related to sensations. <laughs> His work method is closely related to sensations and driven by gestures. Although he is clear to state that the work is internally driven but not intuitive. He has always been interested in the exchange and transformation from the horrific to the beautiful and vice versa referencing animation, film, and science fiction often in his work. Currently, we have many opportunities, there are many opportunities for the public to discuss and view his work, as he has an impressively high concentration of solo exhibitions. One we have here at the Mac next door entitled Pitch Black. There is also a solo exhibition um, at the Art Institute in Chicago. He also has a permanent work now at the FRAC, the France Architectural Reflection, and the San Francisco MoMA. And finally, he has an upcoming show at the Pompidou Center in 2008-2009 entitled Folly Bijour, and we are really looking forward to seeing this. And happy to have you here tonight. The good news for you guys is if this is the first lecture, it can only get better after this one. So whatever is coming after will be better. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what we decide with this discussion format. Um, because of this show that we have next door at Mac, I have to do a lecture there in January. So when we were talking with Brandon, we thought it didn't make too much more sense to do two lectures in two months uh, about the same thing. I'm going to show you pretty much the same work, but the format that we're looking for today is kind of a more open, see, more open discussion. So I'm going to show you work for like around half hour or so, very, very fast. I'm not going to go into the details about what project is what. Um, and then Brennan and I will have a conversation, and hopefully you guys will take part. Um, I think this, this format, honestly, it, it, I think it could be more fun, more interesting, um, especially since the audience is mostly students. So I always find, um, I was a student not so long ago, it started to be longer than it used to. Um, but I always find that those kind of conversations could be more interesting than a plain lecture. Um, today with the web publications and so on, the work is there so you can take a look what it is, but usually I think to talk about what motivates the work or what interests you and so on is, is always a little bit more fun. So I'll just tell you that because I'm going to show you, basically Brennan was asking me about how to organize a lecture and basically to, in terms of the material that I show on the screen, it's always the same. 
Um, so if I have to talk 20 minutes, I talk 20 minutes. If I have to talk two hours, I talk two hours out of it. Um, because it doesn't make much more sense anyways. Um, so that's been said. Um, let's get going. One thing I really like is that people want to go to the bathroom, turn on the light so we can check who's going and who's doing what in the bathroom. So I found that extremely compelling as a place to do a lecture um, because I think it relates closely with the work. Um, so anyway, let's get started. Uh, I would like to start with what I consider the saint of all of architect, and if it's not, it should be Wiley E. Coyote, um, because I think he operates in the way that most of us operate, which is we prepare a lot, we over-design pretty much everything, we make everything more complicated than it needs to be, and most of the times that's not completely go right. Uh, that being said, um, I used to have a much more negative view about it, and I'll tell you more about that at the end, how my position changed. But it's not only about Wiley Coyote as a metaphor, which I hate metaphors, but I like also the idea of cartoons and the idea of to create an immersive world that is fun and playful and childish. Um, I think it's, for, for me, is let me turn on the 28 minutes, so whenever this alarm goes in, I stop, no matter where I'm, uh, where I'm with, the, with the images. That's interesting. But um, what I want to tell you very briefly is more or less what are the things that interest me and how that influences the world. Uh, even though I'm heavily involved in teaching and academic activities, I consider myself just a designer. I'm not that smart. I'm actually I'm fairly lazy, like most of architects. Um, so I never, I don't have like a super highly theoretical thing. So there's a bunch of stuff that I like, I'm interested, and I look at them and see how I can relate to the world. Um, in that sense, the work of Francis Bacon for me is a critical piece uh, to understand in relation to the world for multiple reasons. One, because I think more than any other artist, he's interested in innovation and not in newness. So he always operates within kind of internal disciplinary knowledge. So the techniques that he used are very classical within the painting, but what he produced with them is very disturbing and create a whole different series of conditions. Which also relate to affect, which is probably the thing that interests me the most in terms of the work, but also is the production of aesthetic and kind of the autonomy of the discipline of knowledge in the case. In my case, it's all, all about form. Now, form is controlled and manipulated, as everybody knows, by geometry. Um, this is a essay by Andre Mirallius, which I was lucky enough to work for him, um, called How to Lay Out a Croissant. And basically, what he tried to do here is to convey a whole series of information that moves between the territory of non conventions into a way, into a language that can be translated into something we can understand, but mostly it's a kind of an anomaly. Um, the other thing which is, um, I think you cannot separate what you do from what you are, and I, the truth is I never wanted to be an architect. Um, many claim that I am not, um, I'm probably the right. I wanted to be a filmmaker, um, for different reasons I ended in architecture. Uh, the school of, of films was closed in Argentina, so I ended on, well, became an architect by accident. Uh, nevertheless, working, moving to LA and start to work uh, after studying in Colombia and with all the possibilities to work cinematic softwares and so on, I find a way to start to meet this condition. But what interests me a lot about the idea of, of film is the, the logic that films have, which is for my money way more interesting than the logic that most of architects have, which is the, the cinematic logic and the film logic is much more corrupt. It's all about the final effects and what you're trying to produce. So it's not about the coherency of the methodology or any kind of moral sense of it. So a filmmaker wants to produce an effect and they will mix it between digital mechanicals and whatever it takes. I mean, this is, of course, from the, the first matrix. And the other thing that upsets me about movies is the notion of editing versus the notion of composition, which is a much more architectonic uh, argument. Um, I, I would I will say that in the last 15 years, a couple of, of um, critical shifts have occurred, which some of them interest me big time. And one of them is the notion of uh, the shift from composition to the notion to editing. The other one is the notion of representation into simulation, which is something that I also very interested in. And the third one, I think, 
which is a pair of more peculiar is the shift between a collage model into pixelated model. The idea that the part doesn't have any more meaning by itself, but it's about the combinations of them. So, uh, the, basically the work I show you is the work that we were producing in the office for the last five or six years, and at the beginning all, all of them were about singular surface trying to produce everything. So, the, the work is always very tight to the notion of techniques and how the techniques and technology keep evolving. Um, this is a competition for a park in Lexington in Kentucky that we won, and it's probably one of the few that we won. Uh, I will say most of the competition I will say you, uh, I will show today, we lost all of them. Um, but I like to think that we lost with some dignity, um, if there is any dignity in, in, the, in the field. But you want to like that. So, in any case, the first family of work, which is another thing that interests me a lot, is the idea to work in families. But all these, these concepts are something that you start to understand after, when you do lectures like this one. So it's not like I am in the office thinking, oh, how the hell am I going to think about this problem now? Oh, well, let's come with this idea. No. It's much more about uh, let's make first, they think after. So all these ideas is always kind of a... Uh, it's kind of an autopsy, which is an idea that interests me a lot, the idea that you produce a product and then you try to figure out how that became the genesis for the next one. So, the first series of, the first series of families uh, was about this, like, single, this idea of the singular surface trying to produce everything. So, he got for a big range of competitions, product design, to bus shelter, to installations. And the only one that we got to build at that period was um, this installation that we did in Los Angeles called Emotional Rescue. Now, we spent a couple of years working in all these small-scale projects and after a while um, we decided to start to do competition for bigger projects again um, because as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm, I'm lazy uh, which I think is a good thing um, if we were, if we like to work, we wouldn't be architects, we would be something else but, uh, so what we talk is, well, what we learn out of the, uh, the small notion so we start to think about, well a notion of units and singular entities that can be multiplied to form and produce certain kind of correlation, which it was useful because it allows me to bring back some of the ideas that I was interested in before I start to play around with computers, which is the idea that you can start to have a different relation between the part and the whole. So the singular surface was about to eliminate the part, but then when we start to work with this unit that can multiply and be affected and so on, they can start to deal with the condition of a new relation between the part of the whole. So all these projects were done without any clear agenda, so I would call them more experiments than research because they were more about testing and see how it goes. Then when the work starts to get more specific and you start to focus, we can call it a little bit more research. But again, it's always like an afterthought. So this project, this competition that we did for the YouTube Tower, it became an important one because it's, it was the first one that I start to pay attention to the reaction or the way that the people were reading it and perceiving it. Uh, for me what was interesting is that this project was the first one and I hear the word grotesque and I, I, I hear the word disgusting and I hear the word that's just weird um, which are all very, as we know now, very scientific terms but the, the interesting thing for me was the one that this one started to bring certain kind of picturesque condition, which is something that started to interest me. But the notion of the grotesque and then the horrific became what it started to dictate the work of the author, I would say, and I would argue until now. So when we did this project, um, somebody mentioned the word grotesque, and I, I thought it was an interesting notion, but then when you look deep, um, what you understand is we usually associate the problem of grotesque with disgusting. And it's not true. Grotesque is basically something that cannot be fit with the canons that are established by aesthetics or rules of time. So if you look at the work of Goya when he talks about the grotesque, um, what, when the, his work was qualified as grotesque it was because he didn't fit with the canons at the same time. So grotesque is a condition that emerges, but it doesn't, it's not controlled, it's not specific, and uh, it cannot be argued that clear. To make it more specific, I would say that grotesque is the opposite of cute and horrific is the opposite of elegant. What I mean by that is, if a friend of you is trying to set you up in a date and then tell you, and you ask, is she beautiful? That's my case, but whatever, it's your brand of vodka. Um, and they tell you, no, she's not, she's cute. 
So you know that it means something else. So it's not going to be gorgeous. It's going to be something else. It's going to be cute. So cute is this kind of thing that cannot be defined. Now, horrific, as a positive evidence, is something that can be choreographed, it can be orchestrated, and that's what the real notion of affect is trying to happen. I just show you plans and sections just to show you that we do those things too. Um, so when this project came around and everybody started to go the grotesque and the horrific, that was something that after that we started to pay attention in a more specific way. And as I said, the horrific is the opposite of elegance because it has rules, it has principles, and you can manipulate. So if you think, for example, in Psycho or Alfred Hitchcock, the famous scene in the shower, you know, they that one. So when they were editing, they can choreograph and orchestrate what would be the effective reaction in the audience. And what I mean by that is affect needs to be produced through a cultural frame. So it's different than effect, it's different than atmosphere. To make it more clear, if I point a gun to a dog, it doesn't mean anything to the dog because the dog doesn't understand what a gun is. If I point at you, you're going to be scared because you know what a gun is. So it's an emotional reaction, but it comes through a filter to certain understanding of the cultural production. So if you look at the work of people like Damien Hughes, the notion of the horrific is an interesting one. The other thing that for me was interesting about these things is the notion of organs and species, which is something I will go in a second. The other thing which I've been looking lately a lot is plastic surgery. Maybe because I live in LA and there are very few people left without any plastic in their bodies. Um, me, I'm one of them, even though I can use a liposuction, but I'm too afraid of those things. But nevertheless, this idea of um, horrific, uh, the production of a species, started to tackle in my head. So after that, we started working a little bit more driven work. And that doesn't mean that, in terms of meaning, I'm not interested in meaning whatsoever. I think meaning is pretty useless for architects. Uh, or at least I, I like to think that. But this idea of families and species and cells and genetic codes, it became like an interesting one. So well, this next family of projects that we start to work with, we start to work with a singular cell and can produce a master plan for Busan and a concert hall there in the middle, or a watch that we were doing for Oti at the time. Uh, and the watch uh, and the concert hall at the same time was an interesting concept because basically, well, that doesn't look so good there, right? It's not dark enough, but anyway. Um, the watch is based on the old sand clouds, they have a mood sensor, so you have a good mood, time will go slower, and if you're in a bad mood, time will go faster. So you're having sex, it will feel like two hours, but everybody knows that five minutes are best. But, so, this no, again, the, and the notion of cinematic became more and more strong, and we look a lot into movies, the words the movie usually better the visual effect. So this is for an awful movie called Hollow Man, but you have this amazing simulation of the blood and how the blood aggregates and how the cells accumulate and produce organs and so on. So we were using that idea to develop this notion of the concept. The other thing that we did working with, the, with the, this for the project with the concept hall was one of the first projects that we collaborated with visual effects people from Hollywood. This is, 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 was a piece of work that we started to develop with um, Doug Bailey for the Bailey Finale. So, what was interesting for me about that was the idea to start to, instead to compose it, to see if we can start to grow form, we can grow geometry. So the project would came from, uh, almost from the, we were growing from the balconies and the geometry would grow and orchestrate how the project would be organized instead to compose it by form. So this was the first attempt that sort of set up the, the agenda for the last two years of work. Um, so the formal behavior, the aesthetics, the sensibility is something that we start to look more and more. So, uh, like anybody in this uniform, of course I'm obsessed with the notion of beauty. The problem is for me that the conditions of beauty today, of seduction, of sexuality, and all those things are not the same. We have more options, which means that those things are getting more complex. So, sometimes what is really horrific is really a new condition of beauty or reveals possibility for new condition of beauty. Now, that also helped you to produce some kind of a strategic agenda how you can work, so we start to produce the notion of taxonomies. So, out of each project we're going to start to produce genetic codes. And still, at this, at this time, I wasn't so interested in the notion of species, but it's something that it was starting to emerge out of the world. So, the, the idea that, that you can produce a genetic code and can be multiplied and, and, and mutate and reorganized it's something that became really interesting. So, what out of the taxonomy of the concert hall, 
he became the base for a pavilion that this was a competition and also that we won for the Museum of Modern Art in New York for the core year of PS1. Um, so what we start to produce is, okay, what was the next step that we produced from the console? Well, so the idea was to work with a singular cell that can have variation and certain kind of a cacophony or rhythm. So not so much about repetition, but about the notion of rhythm, something that you can orchestrate a series of transformation that it can be manipulated. But also, this was the first project that we really start to work full, full throat all the way with the cinematic logic. So instead of work so, so, so and so uh, with the composition of the geometry, we start to work much more with the system of cells that can be mutated. So we start to use a scripting and all those tools that technology allows. I don't have so much interest to talk about techniques and technology. We use the same that a lot of people use. So I think we cross the corner that we need to be super specific about that. And nevertheless, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have in that regard. But much more interesting to talk about what you want to produce with that. So if you think, of course, technology enhances and augmented what you can do. So if you think of somebody like Jimi Hendrix, he cannot produce the sound of Little Child, you know, the famous that one without a guava pedal. But to say that Hendrix sounds like that because of guava pedal would be a little bit unfair. He, he did analysis of claims. I have a lot of friends that have electric guitars and a guava pedal, and they don't play like Hendrix. So the other thing that we were trying to introduce through this project was the idea of a cinematic way to present it. So, this project was based in a couple of logic from the first Alien or Real Scott, this idea that you can never see the whole monster, you always see it by parts. So we never, when we present the project, we never reveal the whole configuration, you don't have to see in your face. You can, so when you go to the museum, you go through the courtyard, you'll see all these parts, and only you can read the whole monster, the whole monstrosity of it, um, when you are in the museum. The other thing that we argued for this project was, almost by accident because we didn't do the side model in a black acrylic that look that escaped from a porn movie of the 70s. And what was interesting about the porn in the 70s is they were trying to simulate to be a movie because they were shown in theater. They had to, so they had to have a history, a, a narrative and a script so they would have 75% of mumbo jumbo and 25% of sex. Now VCR killed that because everybody can fast forward to the sex. So we were talking about we have a whole series of argument, but basically it was all about sex, about the formal configuration and so on. So this animation shows a little bit the mission to, to describe the project in those terms and to present it in a cinematic way and not in the traditional thing of steels, drawings and so on. Nevertheless, we still, we still do those. Um, sorry. So these are the animations that we shown today. So, um, I tell you for you that your students, one important thing in any competition that you go to present, make sure that you bring uh, an engineer with a British accent. Uh, because the president of MoMA asked, is this is going to hold? And I said, well, I will let my engineer to answer to that, and he says, in his British accent, but of course, and that was it. They believe that we can do it. Now, the funny thing is the engineer was from all out of New York, and we were with an engineer in out of LA. So the guy in New York never saw the project, but he had a much more convincing accent than our engineer from LA. So I learned that, which is a pretty good thing. So when we mentioned about the porn, he says, oh, you, you like our taste. So I thought, well, fuck it, we're going to win this, and I don't know how we're going to build it. Because they only, you only have, since they tell you that you win until you open, you have seven weeks to build it, and a very low budget. So, but this project became important, not because we built it, uh, which always is an important thing, but because it was the first one I started to uh, say to a third friend of mine, Benjamin Bradford, who told me, your work is all about the image, and the image of the vehicle for the production of form. So the obsession was to make the, the real pavilion to look as close as we could to the render, and not the other way around. Which is kind of a pervert thing, but it's a fascinating thing. So, these are the 4,813, well, you cannot see crap there, but there's a lot of line drawings um, that basically shows... <laughs> they basically show the 400, the 4,832 pieces that we did to produce this project. For some reason, let me see. It's cutting it, but 
you get the picture. I mean, the, the images are much more bigger in my computer. Um, let me see if I, we can fix that for a second. Oops, not a good idea. Oh, it's back. Oh, it's back, but it's worse. God damn it. <laughs> Just give me a second. So these are all the pieces that we have to do as we were going by. So this is a moment that you think, what the fuck, I'm not a minimalist. Um, but nevertheless, we'll figure it out. The script help us to build all these pieces. We build the structure, zippers for the schemes. There was a whole series of part manufacturing in LA. It doesn't matter, but whether our other technology station cover for the rain. Uh, these were the benches that were manufactured in LA that it triggers a whole series of ideas that we developed in other projects because they were produced in LA, very dry weather, and we speed up the, the process with the fiberglass and the car paint. So when we took it to the very hot and humid um, uh, weather of New York, it started to produce these uh, bubbles in the painting. So everybody said, wow, that's grotesque and disgusting. So I said, you're early. Yeah, of course, we did it on purpose. Um, but Nevertheless, you learn about the things and how the process are always alive and they keep being alive. So the next step for us was, um, the other thing is 7,000 people came every Saturday. When they tell you 7,000 people, you don't have a clue what, how many people is that until you see it all together. And these are people who are completely drunk and stoned. So they're not really behaving like in a museum. They are more like savages. So it, it's kind of a brutal thing because it's like seeing your daughter being raped or something. So it is, it's like, I think people shouldn't be allowed to be near the church, but... Uh, so nevertheless, there are these disgusting people there. Uh, <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> anyway, um, so, but we have our happy moment. So nevertheless, the step was, okay, what would we ask? So after that, um, we, we went back again to the science fiction, but movies and play is, is a really great movie, something that is me big time. Um, because it produces this kind of a... I don't know, it's doing this weird thing, hold on. Okay, now we need to be in the other one, sorry. Just weird to be... Um, so, Blade, what is interesting is that the blood um, is not really blood, it's vampire blood, which is, I think vampires are super cool, of course. Um, um, and I like vampires way better than um, zombies. I think zombies are not so interesting. But the vampire blood, what was interesting is at that time, the visual effects, 99, 2000, for me, they were more interesting than now because they weren't so perfect yet. So they still look like a cartoon, so you have this kind of a blood kind of thing. So we start to look at blood and blood tabulation, but not the real blood and the scientific blood, but the cinematic blood of vampires as a way to it. The other thing, which is the title of the show, is Pitch Black, which is another Class B movie with a squeezy actor called Vin Diesel. Um, they have all this kind of a very low tech effect about the creatures being in the dark, and he only can see it because he's blind and appear with this peculiar effect. So, one of the sponsors for PS1 was Nokia, and they hired us to develop a series of concepts about how they can produce a series of kiosk um, exhibitions, or display exhibition for what they produce new products. So, the next step about the singular cells was the idea to start to produce organs, and that's when the notion of species started to happen. And what is interesting about the species is that a species to exist it needs to be contaminated, it needs to be corrupt from some kind of standard logic because if not, it's a hybrid. So you get a horse and a donkey, you will get a mule, but you always will get the mule because they cannot reproduce. So when a species to exist, it's standard contamination needs to happen, which is something that works really well with the notion of cinematic effect because um, the, 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 the cinematic logic is always very corrupt, so you can use a lot of external behavior to produce that. So 
the next step for us was to start to figure out how these cells can start to grow into organs, so how it can start to mutate and lose the idea that you can read them as a singular entity, but start to read them as something that can produce something else. And I don't know if the DVD is not playing because the format of the projector or what. Let's see if you would play there. No, it's not playing anyway. <coughs> Sorry about that, guys. Well, you don't have a lecture until you have a technical problem. So now we have a lecture. It's not a discussion anymore, it's a lecture. Um, but basically, this was the idea. So how we can take similar cells that we want to produce one, but allow them to mutate to produce a continuum organ, and to take to the stream some of these ideas that we were doing about the bubbling, so to transform that into follicles, and how that can become some sort of a feature they can introduce how they can connect and relate with the other objects. So this is supposed to be a small pavilion where they, will can, they can place the packaging for the phones. Uh, of course, they didn't do it. They, 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 but this idea of follicles and grow and that kind of a grotesque, aggressive thing start to be mutated, growing, and so on. So, um, going back to power um, so this was the packaging with the cell phone would be inside and they would be plugging into the kiosk and you can take it to your home and put it in the wall as a piece of art. So it would, ch it would charge your phone and when the form is changed, the hair would come out and so on. And we developed also a, a headphone with a screen that would be like a second tattoo. It would be like a tattoo that you can apply to your skin and so on. So this project got us nowhere but it became like an interesting experiment about how to um, how to explore these notions of the horrific and the grotesque in a much more specific manner. Uh, I lectured last week in Colombia, and, and Mark Wigley, when he introduced me, he started to talk about creepy, and the idea of creepiness more than horrific and grotesque, and I find that an interesting notion, because creepy could be something nice and friendly too, but we have these other weird conditions. So I think the work when operates between the horrific and the grotesque is really about creepy and creepiness. The other thing that the PS1 project brought us was uh, this guy in New York, uh, our client, and he bought a big piece of land in the Dominican Republic, and he asked us to develop a couple of ideas, and every week, literally every week, he would change his mind. So at some moment we get tired, uh, and we told him, well, why we don't develop like a genetic code, and then we'll have everything that you want. He go from his house, to a hotel and restaurant, to a tower. So it's not really not a project, it's more like a genetic code, they have the capacity um, to absorb all that. So it becomes more like an experiment than a real project, but nevertheless, it became a useful element because it produced a whole taxonomy of, of, a whole taxonomy of, of genetic codes that they one that we use in now. So out of that series of families, they always work, we always work in four or five projects at the same time because it's easier, trust me, because you can jump from one or the other and bring it to the one. So we try to exhaust how far each family can go. This, this was a competition that we did for a park in Boston. And in this one, we start to incorporate and push more and more the notion of science fiction, the notion of to isolate the abstraction of the form and the autonomy of the form more and more. I think part of the trick that we obsess is the idea that we can eliminate and cancel almost the boundaries and resistance. So all the time, we try to speculate as much as we can to isolate the project for any kind of a context and so on. And it allows them, like the cartoons, to start to create their own world, their own life. Um, so out of this series of families of projects, I'm going to show you the last four projects very quick. Um, we can make a couple of series of exhibitions. It seems that we get a bit of reception in the art world as creators and museums and clients. So every time that they invite us to do a solo show, we always push to see if we can fabricate and build something because we don't get to do that many buildings. So this was a display system for the this show which was called Sangre, which means blood in Spanish in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So we did all the contraction drawings to fabricate this piece and it was fabricated by the company in LA and that's uh, a stage, a stage uh, set for movies. So, and we start to exacerbate more and more the notion of follicles and hair. And the idea of the show, which is 
conceptually it's not so different than the one that we have in the Mac, is that we don't show construction, we don't show drawings, we don't show any kind of sense of traditional set of information of architecture, even though we show it, it's more about the effect and the affect that they produce. So it's more like a magician performance, you, you do the trick but you don't show how you do it. So part of the, so the, the, the show, the mission of the show is to produce the sense of affect, so we have this display system. So when you walk in, there will be all these families of yourself, there are five projects on it. So we show all the genetic codes and how they evolve through the mutation that we do to, to films and, see, and, and, and short films and cinematic effects that we produce, and how they consolidate as a speculation about architecture as a display system and, and a series of models here. You can see the Dominican Republic project, the one in the back is the YouTube Tower, um, the concert hall, the PS1, the things that we did for Nokia, follicles and hair, and sweaty and as pornographic as we can do it. Pornographic from the 70s when still they used to use used to have pubic hair. Not anymore than they look like plastic dolls. Um, so porn you say is not so interesting. So the project was that was located in the SF moment, then mutated in a different configuration to the Art Institute in Chicago. So it was in the Art Institute in Chicago we can more break it into parts, so it more it was more about the part than, than the whole. Um, the last two projects I want to show you, one is a competition that we did for the Aspen Library in Estocolm. And they were all operating under, under the same logic um, that, that we are interested in now. We have to do with kind of incorporate also liquidity and this science fiction, metal, cold, aggressive um, aesthetic. Um, so, Some of these, if you saw the show, some of these animations are in the show. And as I said, it's not the intention of today to do like a full lecture. I mean, promise me that you go back in December to the Mac and I'll explain every project. Now, it's more to tell you what is the set of the things so we can have a conversation. So, again, the cells keep mutating, we keep evolving. Hopefully, we think we keep evolving the species and into more complex uh, formal organizations. At the same time, uh, it's always feedback from what you teach and also we speculate it in, into the exhibition. So the three legs into the practice teaching and exhibition for me is really important because I don't make a distinction. For me, it, everything part of the same territory and everything is part of the same investigation. Um, but in this one was to try to incorporate if we can create envelope and we can create skin systems into the project. Um, I don't know how, how well you can see it, they seem extremely dark. Um, but so I don't know if we can increase the brightness or anything, but I, I, it is what it is. We, we live with it. Um, so that's that. So this is the this is the plan for it. Couple of renders. Uh, these are the models of, of a clip that I will show you at the end, which is a, a, a thing that we did for the History Channel and the Imaginary Forces called the Cities of the Future. This is a little hint of what we're doing in the Pompidou next year. It's called Folie Vergès. Folie Vergès was a decadent burlesque cabaret at the end of the 19th century, 20th century. The Moulin Rouge was the high-end version. The Folie Vergès was a decadent one. So I always thought that the French have that kind of a funny perversity, which I like a lot. Um, for those of you, I mean, Francois is coming next year, so you know what I mean. Um, and this is what we're supposed to do in the, in the main hall on uh, the, the Pompidou Center. Um, it's, it's still a work in progress. Um, it's, not, it's not so sure how it's going to turn out. This is another, um, this is another project work in progress, which is a pedestrian bridge that we are doing in Dominican Republic. Um, it looks like it's going to be built. Um, I don't know how much it's going to cost and how we're going to build it, but so far they seem to be fairly excited. <coughs> um, and it's, based, it's part of the same species of monster that we're working lately. 
So it's all about, if you look at it, it's always kind of a similar cell than the start, and then the idea is to see how much mutation we can get out of that, and how much, how much we can stretch into became a bridge, or became a library, or became a series of small objects on display, like the, the, the spiders that we did for the Max Center, or a series of things that we do for product design for a couple of companies. Um, so it always works. I mean, one of the things that fascinates me the, mo the most about this cinematic software is the notion of that they are sort of scaleless. This condition that you can, a sensibility and aesthetic can operate back and forth between different conditions. So <coughs> the idea for the bridge actually is a very complex form, 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 but at the same time it's very simple. It's about to have multiple ways to cross. I, if you live in one side and you want to cross to the other part, so you want to have options every day to cross in a different manner. So this is uh, uh, kind of the plan of it. And this is work in progress. It's not, it's not a project that is finished. And we're working on, on it right now. And little exhibitions like in the map, it became like an interesting platform for us to test the setting and how we would work and so on. Um, the, the very the project before the last one is a competition that we did for a house in Paris and we didn't win, but we got a commission out of her. It's a, it's a guest house for the art collector and all, all the house of Andrew Block, the famous French sculptor. She's an art collector, so she has this existing house, so we have to develop the guest house dash gallery dash pavilion here. And basically the bridge, the Mac, and this project were done at the same time. So the idea is to keep figuring out, um, let me show you the animation. So if you, if you look at what I just show you the bridge and this, basically the cell behavior and the, the grow and the mutation is fairly similar. I'm in my last two minutes, so I need to speed up. Um, but for me, this project I'm very happy because it was, it's truly the one that we really start from this. We really start from the cinematic logic to explore it. So the, the, the kind of architectural behavior came really after. So it wasn't like a back and forth corrupt logic, but it was a more pure one. So we speculate using a series of transformation to particles and some scripting to produce all the series of families of mutations. So at the end of the day, it produces a, a huge stream set of differentiation, but it's based only on three repetitive cells, and then the members and connect them are the ones that are extremely different. So the idea is that you produce a skeleton, then you can grow the stairs, you can grow the floor plates, grow the skins out of it, which is my obsession for next. Um, one of the things I'm obsessed now that we try to explore here with Studio Nangivante is incorporation of color and coloration, and this is something that we haven't been that successful doing that in the world. So it all has been this kind of a metal liquid <coughs> thing. So the next step I'm obsessed is start to figure out how color can start to become part of this problem. Um, so this is how you get really into the house. Let me get you to the cheesy moment. Which is every animation needs to have a cheesy moment. So you can decide you see there the woman walking, which is way better looking than the client. The client is either cute or beautiful. She's rich, which is much more important. Um, <laughs> So we're getting close to the momentum of cheesiness. Wait for it. Wait for it. It's coming. There you go. So that you need to have a moment of cheesiness. Um, Could you design the animation to show it? Yeah, I mean, it was a competition we have to show to the clients, um, the potential clients. But the truth is, I mean, we lose a lot of competition, a lot of potential projects because I don't make much more of a difference. The way I present it to you is not that different than the way I present it to them. So here you can see the whole genetic code, plans, uh, just to show that we do it, that they exist, and we like them a lot. But I think plans and those drawings are like an intimate thing. You only show it when it's necessary, but you don't show it to anybody. I'm trying to don't be a whore all the time. So, so the hook. Um, interior shots, blah, blah, blah. The art. Some 
vegetation to show that there is some life in it. Uh, these are some part of the galleries, uh, a structure, foundations, details about how we can assemble the things. Um, the, the, the thing for me is very important to clarify for you, especially in the, in the, in the context of the school and so on. It doesn't matter how creepy and, and radical the world may seem, we really think in all the problems are architectural problems. I, I like to think as an architect, so every project that we do, we do it with a mission to be built. I mean, we don't do it as a pure speculation, even though it looks impossible. We try to figure out how we can build it. I don't say that we can do it for cheap, but we try to think on the problem. I mean, we, I don't like the idea to isolate and don't put the work ever in friction. So for me, we always try to put this in friction in the context of the work uh, as a project of architecture. Uh, these are the show of the map, so I can show you some details about how we fabricate them. And so on. I assume that most of you saw it. If not, please go and try to don't break anyone. Already one kid break one. So that I can take more than one, it will become tough. So I said, but anyway, this is kind of stupid to show you because it's next door. So just go and see it. Um, so I don't know how we do with the time. We should, should we show the history channel thing or we just jump to com the conversation? Yes? Um, okay, so either way to me, this is okay. And the only thing is the audio. Let, let me try to see if we can make it work with the microphone. If not, I'll, you're going to have to go back in January to the Mac uh, and see it there. But let's see if we can make it work. <coughs> right. uh, if not, I'll show you a little bit. What it means. This was the uh, History Channel last year asked a bunch of films across the country to propose how the cities are going to be 100 years from now. So we were one, one of the offices invited to think about how LA is going to be in the, in the year 2116. And because being the History Channel and everything, uh, we thought to treat it as a documentary that we were in the year to have. 2116. So we hired an actor to talk about it. We did this with the Imaginary Forces, which is a firm that I got to them, thank to Greg, and they the collaborate a lot with, with Greg, and to Greg, a bunch of artists, and we get to collaborate with them. So let me see if we can make it work. And it was called Chlorophyllia. Tell me if it works, if not.
instead of having to program our environment, we allow the environment to allow the artificial intelligence to grow itself. Here's one. This new intelligence forces us to evaluate instead to force us to bring in the ornament of nature. We had to understand the design behind nature and how it applied to our world. We had to bring nature back into the information loop. It couldn't just be between humans anymore. We had to let it communicate with us however it needed to to make us understand. Grits can only touch each other in one way. Cells go like the paper. They can reform and recombine and retouch and reconnect in different ways. Buildings have no knowledge of that. They have no understanding of how to realign themselves or limited to what people have told them to do or told them to be. What we've discovered now is the idea that the building will understand itself, that the connections and parts will constantly shift depending on the situation. It's not stuck. The new plan for Los Angeles was affordable and immediately functional. What we know today is the aqueducts didn't always disperse the nutrients of the jungle. They were once highways, the 5, the 10, the 405, that were all traveled with things called cars, crude efficient versions of vehicles that we use today. But of course, the people of Florida still have an attachment to their cars. What was worked out with the jungle was a new type of vehicle, one that flies, drives, floats on water, and refuels by plugging into the organic matter of the city. When I was younger, had to be filtered through several computer devices. There were televisions, telephones, computers, satellites, video games. Just hell, thank gorgeous for the clouds. I remember the first time I saw the clouds, but now I can't imagine living without them. A puff of vapor, whenever you want, that assesses your needs and then produces a response to fill that need. If you need to talk to someone, the vapor finds them and connects you to them through another cloud. When the cloud first tapped into our thoughts, it was almost all porn. But eventually the novelty wore off, and people became interested in other things again, although there's still a lot of porn. But this new species, the, the, the complexity of form, and porophilia, the, the idea of how you can't do concept, that the that aren't going to be made by them grow and respond. You know, it's just like a song and team play, right? It's a living service, like a cultural memory. You can see the city of the It's a concept. That's what's done. that difference of what we do. So failure has to be part of the plan. <laughs> the 
Merci. Well, I, I would say that that's more like a, limi a limitation than, than a virtue. Um, I think I work more with form because it's basically what I know how to do more. I mean, so that for me, the ambition is to keep going beyond that. Um, but if you think in terms of architecture, historically, it's like people who work in form, um, Uh, people who work in form, there always has been the touch from the notion of ethics and so on, and the people who work with the kind of a more minimal sensibility always are the ones that work with more colors and so on. Um, so what, I talk, what I'm trying to find is, in my view, the natural state of architecture is form. So the, it's never a literal translation. I don't think that the visual effects from a movie apply directly in the same way that you can do it in form. But there are things that you can learn, and one thing that interests me more and more is this idea of the non-recognizable edges, or the non-recognizable notion of an object as a form. So if you can produce a form that is not clear that you, how you can read it as a whole, I think that starts to be associated with the problem of effect more and more. Because then you can start to work with reflections, you can start to work with densities, and so Right now it's fairly primitive, but that's mostly the main vehicle that we're working right now. So I think color hopefully will start to incorporate something else. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's part of who you are. And I was educated in Argentina before I studied in the States. And Argentina is a hardcore modernism. And in a weird way, I think always that is in the back of your head. So I always have a hard time working with light, with color. I, I always find them, even in people who does it very well, that sooner or later became cheesy. So it, it's kind of a, kind of a, my own problem with it. And I, and I think that you can learn a lot from people. I think Gray has been a pioneer and advocate on that, to don't be afraid of those things and so on. It's still, I have a hard time. I mean, like, I admire when people like Greg or people like Zaha or Herzog and Amaro, and they work a lot with that, they do it. But at the same time, it's like my brain have a hard time to it. So I think part of the high level of more and more complexity that we keep adding with the form is with the ambition to keep producing, to see if we can produce more special effects coming out of the form. In terms of form, I want to bring up uh, Greg and Peter Eisenman, not because of yeah. uh, but because they are working quite clearly with form as well, but in a totally different way, Greg, with in terms of I think in a different way. Greg in terms of topology and mathematics and yep. construction now, I think, and Peter in terms of process and, and index. Can you talk about your view of form and the way you think of form in relation to those things? We are recording this, right? So it's, it's, I don't know how honest I can be, but I'll, I'll do my best. Even, and nevertheless, honesty is overrated, as every married, every married person knows. Um, but I think there are two things. One is this disciplinar knowledge that comes from that, and the other one is the personal take on it. So I think people like Peter has been on the forefront about that condition, about to think of form as a process, as a methodology. But I think you can relate it to the, the notion of affect in terms of music. In the 19th century, the, the, at the end of the 19th century, there was an interesting philosophical discussion about the two musical way of composing. So the, the kind of a two paradigmatic discovered music composition was the Mozart model and the Bach model. The Bach model, for those of you who understand music, 
is all about basic notation and the precision is mathematical and everything has an order. So I would say people like Peter operates in that territory. And then the Mozart methodology is based more on melodies, more based on the affect. So the notation became as a way to translate what the melody was established. So I think somebody, people like Greg or other people who work with Peter, and I think Peter has been the most influential figure in that sense, I think they start to contaminate that and produce that kind of innovation. So I think what happened with that condition is that still the project has this kind of a narrative condition or a text condition that needs to be written. Personally, my, my take on it is I worked for Peter, I was a student of Greg, but also was a student of Kidneys, which is a master of affect. But there is a fundamental part too, which is I work for Mirages. So, and Rick was a different kind of animal because he had a very precise kind of work, but also was a work that it was based on some sensibility and corruption of it. So it wasn't so methodological, it was much more about the sensibility and a way to figure out, I wouldn't call it style, but it would be about those conditions. So it took me a while, and I think I'm still in the middle of it, to try to con I mean, how you figure out the influence of people like that when you work with them and study and so on, how you start to find your own voice. So for me to start, in that sense, I think it's a lot like digital music. So I was to sample and I start to mix things, and that helped you to start to find your own sound. So I use a lot of the techniques and methodology that came from Peter and Greg, but at the same time, I try to contaminate and work, which is more in my nature, so, I'm interested in the notion of intuition. I think intuition is a form of intelligence. It's something that you develop over time, and if it came more or less smart, it would produce a sense of sensibility. So, I think it operates a little bit like that, but to keep with the music analogies, which I think are useful, I, I think um, somebody like Eisman would be like Duke Ellington in jazz, or somebody who did the transition between this model of composition of Bach and so on, and then I would say somebody like Greg or some more like somebody like Dexy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, and have the capacity to create almost like a new genre. I think people of my generation, we are not that radical because I think we are manifesto free and we are not that innovative in that sense. So I would say my generation is much more like Coltrane and, and Miles. So you can go the Miles Davis direction, it's about coolness and review things, or go Coltrane, which is saturated more notes, more sounds, and take it to the street. But you're not the one creating the genre, you're, you're the one taking the genre to an extreme. So the problem, for me, it's a personal thing. I, I, I'm not a methodological guy, so for a while I tried to be like very precise, and, and it didn't work, and it didn't. And, and then, the, to be absolutely honest, is you want to find your own voice, and then you start to figure out, well, what I can do different than these guys haven't done. And you try something, and some of them were awesome, they did not. But uh, I think there's extremely value in that, and I really believe there's a super valid pedagogic model. I would argue that Peter and, uh, and Greg and people like that produce, in my view, the most interesting uh, education system because I think it allows you then to find your own voice. So they don't teach based on the style, they teach based on methodology. So I find that extremely useful. And I recommend to go through a period like that. But at the end of the day, again, coming back to the music thing, it's not different than when you go and learn music. You have first you have to learn how to do scales. So a method for that is pretty useful. But after a while, then you just have to act. It's like the, the old discussion between Dustin Hoffman and Lawrence Oliver when they were doing Marathon Man, right? Dustin Hoffman came for the actor studio method, um, sensible memory, and all the, and, and all and all the things, and. Um, so Dustin Hoffman was playing in this marathon man, so he was exhausted and he was tortured by Lawrence Oliver to play some sort of Mengele, Nazi, everybody saw that movie, I hope, if not, see it, it's an interesting one. So he didn't sleep for three days, so he was running to look exhausting, so he arrived to the set and Lawrence Oliver said to him, but Dustin, you look like shit, what's going on? Well, my car just went through all these things, so I want to, and Lawrence Oliver looked at me, why don't you just act? So there is a little bit going back and forth. So in all the things it's interesting when somebody asks Anthony Hopkins how when he did an evil lecture. So he says, How you got into the brain of a serial killer? And I said, What? No, I just look my cat. 
for seven weeks and I just reproduced his face movement in front of the camera because my cat looks fucking scary to me. So that's what he did. And the guy won an Oscar and he's a master class of acting. So you have to channel a different way to start to find your own voice. Nevertheless, I think method and system is very useful. But in terms of intuition, I mean, I think affect and evocation are much more um, subtle and subjective than meaning or meaning, which are sort of um, traditional. I'm a huge advocate for subjectivity. So how, but how do you balance intuition and then sort of precision more? You also seem to be sort of trying to nail down some of those relationships, which are really subjective. Well, I think that's what techniques became really useful. I think you have your own intuitions and see the one you want to produce, but then I, I'm personally interested in virtuosity. Um, whatever, whatever qualities my work has, I think he has quality of virtuosity. Right? What we do is, is it's pretty difficult to do that geometry and form, even though it looks, doesn't look like it. And I, I think it looks easy, but it's not so difficult. It's not, it's not so easy. So the notion of virtuosity for me is an interesting one, to figure out how to you master the technique, how to do that. And for me, that is a little bit, uh, it's something that Mirage used to say, that at the end, you do architecture the way that you make your bed in the morning. Like, in some moment, you learn how to do it, you know the technique, but every day you do it slightly different, but at a certain level, you're doing it. So, I think, the way, for me, the balance is through the technique, to keep incorporating the technique and keep pushing that, and with the possibility that that will give you new, new textures, new sounds, new colors, new forms. So in that sense, it's very straightforward, it's very narrow, it's mostly through technique and also through teaching. I mean, teaching is a very powerful tool to figure out problems like that. But at the end of the day, I think you have to be extremely honest with yourself about what interests you, what, what, what you like, what you don't like. So I think many of the things is a lot about how you explain to somebody how, why you're in love with the person that you're in love, right? So if I have to explain to you, I can narrow a bunch of things why I'm in love with my wife, and I can explain and we can have a conversation, but there's a deep thing which is kind of not tangible, and I think it's interesting. But now, the way to rationalize conversation to language to whether the right word is kind of a notion of techniques and the capacity to know more and more about the vocabulary. So, I know there's a lot of discussion about the evolution of architecture and so on, and I heard the other day to say something really interesting to. Uh, to a musician that says that actually music never evolves. Music is always there, and basically what you do is to learn more and more on the language. You, know, you learn more and more possibilities about what you can do, so sounds start to appear that they, you didn't hear before, but it's not that they didn't exist, because the notes are always the same. It's basically about how you incorporate that. So for me, the way to, to negotiate that is through techniques and to do it again and again and again. But also being absolutely honest about what you're interested, what you're interested. In. And does teaching, how does teaching relate to that? Is, and also, is there a benefit for you to, to be working in different types of institutions? I mean, you're, you're teaching in a lot of different places. Yeah, I mean, the benefit is you get three times more money. But uh, uh, aside the Matilda one. Um, well, each institution has a different kind of genetic code. So, for me, teaching, I, I never teach anything that we do in the office. I always teach when I'm interested in going. So, sometimes I don't have, I mean, the students ask me, they, well, I don't know, let's try this and that and see what it works. So, for me, teaching is great because it became like a platform laboratory to figure out where the ideas can go. Teaching in different places is interesting because, in my case, I use that to isolate variables and I was in this floor. I, I'm, Actually, every student that I do is very kind of, the topic is very narrow. So right now, for example, I'm doing pretty much the same studio here, Sayak and Columbia, but each of them have different emphasis. So, I mean, for example, Nyan Gevante are really interested in kind of the genealogy of the European tradition of tectonics, right? So it's not that we're doing a tectonic studio, not at all, but the idea is how we can speculate about this and how they will have the capacity to relate with the current tectonics. With the Columbia students, is a graduate master and so on, they have a much more kind of a more abstract, artistic, theoretical background. So you can speculate about certain kind of line of argument, so the work will be less sophisticated and less virulent in terms of the geometry, but it will have like a kind of a more, uh, more cultural 
context placement. And the way in SIAC, SIAC is all held in the strong tradition of making, so it's much more focused in assemblage of the form and how they can produce things. So it's very useful because, first of all, it's, all the students are different, and also usually, if I could choose, I always would, I would love to teach in every place that I never taught before. It's much more exciting because, it's, first of all, the students don't know you, you don't know the students, so there's, it's like everything else, right? It's like first night of sex, first night when you get drunk, drugs, whatever. Over the first time, it's right. Then, then you have to use the imagination to keep it interesting. But, but I think there's some kind of at that level of, um, they, they surprise you, because also they're not contaminated by the notion of what is expected of a studio to produce. Um, so teaching, is, it, for me, is incredibly important. I mean, the work in the office wouldn't exist without it. And for example, this semester we're doing a lot of emphasis on, on color, and we're doing a lot of emphasis on assembly between forms, um, on how to use that and not to produce all continuous, but how more to interlock it. So they have common topic, but then each of them have different backgrounds. So it's, uh, I, actually, I don't think that you can be an interesting architect if you don't think. Actually, I would argue that at least all the architects I'm interested in and look at their work and look what they do, they all teach. Because it's, 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 it's the only way that to keep your brain oxygenated. And also because the truth is, younger people than you always are better and in the end they're all going to get better than you. I mean, I find, I find it a little bit disturbing when I go to schools and the work of the students is less radical than your own work. There's something wrong there. So I always think that the students need to go after and eat our liver as possible. Of course, we're going to put the fight, but, but uh, no, I think teaching is, is absolutely critical for the work. And all, all the work, all the projects, I mean, all the people in my office are all, all of them former students of mine. I never hire anybody who hasn't been my student. Um, there are people who graduated four years ago, people who just, but the whole evolution of the work is all based on the studio. So if you look around the dates of each of these projects, and you look at the website of the schools, of the semester before, you're going to see the genesis of what we're trying to do in the office. So, it's, for me, it's absolutely critical. And I also talk about sucking the blood of younger people. It's a vampire strategy. So you keep sucking the blood of young people. There are no more virgins left, but the <laughs> next big thing is young people for blood. So you can keep young. Which I'm not that young anymore, but we we'll try. And we, we have a bunch of questions from the a lot of them were about um, occupation and use of um, architecture. Don't know, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to lower it? Okay. Um, no, well, the truth is, when we are designing, don't care. I really don't care about it, but you know that everything that you do potentially has an audience. But I used to be. I, like in the old joke, right? I used to be arrogant, now I'm perfect, but I used to be much more arrogant with the answer than then I found that that was absolutely stupid. And when somebody asked me, well, what about the people? Well, I don't care about people. When all the people ask you, when do you know when you're done with the form is right? And I always would answer, well, how do you know when you end up having sex? You just know. Or you fake it, either way. But, um, but now, I think it's not fair because also I, think, I don't think it's completely honest. So, so I, I don't, we don't design with how thinking who would use it. We, we design it thinking somebody would use it. But I think what I learned through the years is never trust an architect who tell you about the people. Who tell you we did this for the people, the people are going to use it, this and well, how they know? That's always my question. So every target that says we do this for the people, it's not true, they're doing that for the developers or whoever is putting the money. That's a different thing. I think what we do have like an honest take for the people because I think the world will provocate, hopefully, some reaction. It will wake up certain conditions that people would relate to that form. It was interesting to see PS1, the first, everybody would walk, the first 15 minutes, everybody would be looking at I don't know what to do, and two hours after you will see the, 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 that little chubby girl like that. So everybody figure out how to use them, they seem to be interesting. So I think what you do with the people is, I think you have to challenge and you have to provocate. I think an architect should do what the people want if the people knew what they want. So I think it's our job to provocate them and start to establish. So that's the only relation I can think that we do with the people. And how you use it, 
I think it's part of, believe it or not, a project that we do, it works, we have a functionality because I spent seven years of my freaking life in Argentina education doing plans and sections and functional programs, so we know how to do that. I just don't find it as an interesting driving force, but all of them can be used, and, but we try always to speculate how they can be used in a different way, so it's not different than anything else. So, it, I always find it extremely, architecture is romantic, it's melancholic, and it's slow, and it's always funded in the past. It is what it is, it's one of the oldest visions. But I always find it interesting how we keep asking all those questions when it comes to architecture and other things and they keep changing, which is a Like 20 years ago, we wouldn't use cell phones that have all the capabilities that they have now. You can walk watching a movie on your phone. Nobody asks that. I mean, have you, you just absorb them, incorporate them, re-adapte them and so on. But it seems that every time that we talk about how architecture should be used and blah, 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 it's always about how we would by some rules that was set up in the 1900s and modern and tweak it a little bit here and there, but fundamentally still when you see in dwell manners and all those crappy manners in our houses, the houses have this mostly, except a few exceptions, the same organization that they have in 1920. The people doesn't live in the same way. I mean, most of the people are divorced and have, so an architecture doesn't update. I mean, I, I'm not so interested in that part, that's why I'm much more interested in form and so on, because I think it's a much more durable thing than program and usability and so on, because I think the use change all the time. So I think you provocate the interesting sense of space, the interesting sense of effects and sensibilities and so on, that will have a longer life because it can be reinterpreted and reordinated. But the truth is when we're doing the work, we don't think in them that much, that's what we don't have that many times. Saying like I tried to understand it that you were saying that you you were like more the Dr. Jekyll and back in Argentina was able to draw plans and sections. Now you turn more to the rebellion, the challenger. Oh, we still do plans. Sorry. We still do plans. Yeah. So I like, like plans, but we do it after. But like the question was like if you can be like the Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll, yeah. don't you see it also as a challenge to be like to combine it to one person and like. Well, you are all the time. As I said, it's not that we don't do it anymore, it's just we don't use that as a driving force for the project. But I still believe in plants. I never believe that much in sections, because I come from the Mirage side. So if you come from the Hinnom Blau side, the section is everything. And the plan is to organize. Uh, and I think it's great. And I like plants a lot, and still I think they're important. I don't think it's one or the other. But I think things evolve, and things should change, right? Um, we don't ride horses anymore, we take cars, cars. But Vietnam people still use bicycles a lot, but that's a different story. So I, I never see it, I never see it as a as a dichotomy. I still we do them, it's just what it what it changes what drives the war. So still we do all those things and we have to do it when you have to build it, so you have to go through all that. So you do it. Um, but I don't find plants and sections that interesting anymore as a driving force. But they still, I love a good plan. It's, it's my favorite drawing of a project still. Because it's like going back to be, like going to, to be a teenager. So, but I don't see myself as a doctor shaking on Mr. High. I think everybody is a little bit like that. But, um, I still think that we operate in, between those two worlds. Uh, and that's okay with me. I mean, I think the moment that you, when you decide that when you want to produce is architecture, you operate in still between the two worlds. Um, I never talk about my work like it was art. I never talk about my work in the way that it's a movie. We try to do architecture. I mean, all the time. Every project that we do it, we do it with ambition to be architecture. From the product, even when it's a product design or anything, I only can think as an architect because it's the only thing I am. Um, so I think that remains a stable condition. But. We don't, I mean, you can still play music with the Spanish guitar and you can go to the opera and, and, and hear a symphony, right? But there's a lot of other much contemporary ways to do music and not arguing that one is better than another. Um, I just think that there has to be a certain commitment. About, I, I, think, I, I really think that an architect should have a commitment to contemporary 
life. Mm -hmm. And I never talk about this work that this is the future. This is, I said, the thing that we did for the channel, of course, but everything else, when everybody talk about that, the science fiction, architecture, affairs, it's all bullshit. I mean, this is now, and we've been doing, we've been doing it now. So. But it may be that that contradiction that you mentioned exists, and I just don't see it like that, but it may be so. In your design process, uh, do you think about materials? And, uh, and after, like after the, the finished design, are you actually letting the, the other people to work with um, technology? I always saw that as a... Um, I don't see it as a strength. I don't think in materials that much, um, but I don't see that. Uh, I'm proud of it. I, it's kind of a limitation. You know, it's the way that my brain works. Um, I, my, I need to liberate my, my brain from that to think about it. And I like to. I believe a lot in the concept of expertise. So I like to work a lot with people who knows how to do those things better than me. Um, because also I like to be surprised. I like that the project take a different tour than you expected. So. Um, but it changed from project to project, to tell you the truth. When we did PS1, we knew how we would do it. Uh, not exactly to the last minute, but we, we, I knew the material was small, but other projects you don't. Um, like this little thing that we did for the Mac originally, we were planning to do only metal. They are not metal, they are plastic. Chrome by a car process system. And because somebody, one of the guys who fabricated it, he told me, well, it's just faster, cheaper. It's gonna cost less money to ship them because it's plastic weight less. Let's do it like that. It's gonna look more beautiful, more precise. He showed me, hey, okay, okay, let's go with this one. So in that sense, I'm much more corrupt. I'm not, uh, I'm not that. But again, I think you should think like you know, I mean, it's another variable that would be better if you incorporate it. The way that I think in, in the cinematic way and so on doesn't go that well with that. But it's one of the things that. That's probably the topic for next year of teaching, going to materials. Step by step. Now we go to color, next year material. <coughs> the year after we go into structure. The year after we go into how we can do it for cheap. If you were a musician, would you be a more the guy with writing out notations and playing with them, like just with the notation and see what result comes from? when you give it to, to uh, an instrument and they start playing it, maybe it's the fact what it's creating, or would you collaborate with the instrument and see the feedback? No, I, I see it, I see what, what, what I do much more like a, like a jam session. No, I, I'm playing with it. I mean, like, uh, in the office, uh, even today, which I spend half of the time in an airplane, I, I still do all the basic cells. I always sit my ass in front of the computer in the software and I do it. And I, I like them to give it back, and every render that you saw there, it was done by me. All of them. I mean, the final image that comes out of the office is always done by me. So no, I still like to to do it. I, mean, I, I wouldn't know how. It, it's, it's a fun. It, it's the most fun part. Like, I never like to. In the design process, and in the construction process, I'm very happy to go once a week and see how it goes. I don't like that part. I don't like to touch anything. And where would you be now? Uh, you were in another century where there is no computer or? I don't know how it would be if it was a woman or a dog. I mean, <laughs> I mean, probably if it was a woman it would be a slut, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but before, look, let me put it this way. I don't think that what I do looks like it looks because I use computer. I think I, I use computers because I'm interested to do what I'm interested to do. So I, did, I didn't touch a computer until I was 28. Not, if, not even for an email. I didn't touch a computer until I went to Columbia, New York. Never before. So, um, but when I saw the potential, I'm, 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 it says that it's no more faith than the, way, the faith of the converted. So my office is 100% paperless. We don't. Sure, we don't have papers and pens, we don't sketch, it's nothing. And they're not even models, all the models are manufactured somewhere, 3D print, whatever, I'm gonna bring it. Um, it's, like a, it's like a surgery room, so it's very tiny too. But, um, so yeah, I, I convert that. I'm, I'm a born again, I'm a born again computer guy. 
So the computer is Jesus for me. Um, I'm not so sure I understand the question. That the, the interface, what we use today for design, yeah. that it's not advanced enough. I agree, no, yeah. For the I mean, when you go, I'm, I'm fairly good friend with a couple of people from the design department in Audi and the Santa Barbara University at the same time, they're doing all the virtual space that they're doing. Uh, and they're using these things like Minority Report. Uh, I mean, this is like my wet, my wet dream. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I think the interfaces are not, they're not that good yet. Um, well, hopefully we get there. Um, but I'm, I'm a big fan and love technology. But at the same time, you have to keep your mind open. I mean, like I have no, I'm much more interested to have an idea, an argument, a sensibility, I want to pursue it because every year, but well, every year, every month new technologies and new tools are coming available. So I think what is interesting right now is that it's totally incorporated, everybody absorbs it, it's there, nobody argues anymore. So I think it, this is an exciting time because I think we are back in the time that you have to figure out what is what you're after and try to put it clear. So uh, I don't think it's enough anymore to argue, like you guys don't remember, but if you will go to a lecture like this, 10, 7, even 5 years ago, my presentation would be talking about the software, every tool that we use, every technique, and that would be the argument. Today, everybody is using the same tools, the same techniques, so we are going back again to a different kind of discussion until the next wave of radical technology and innovation will happen, and we'll have to react to it. And if you look at the work of the really prominent architects, they always have that capacity. But at the same time, you belong to a certain species in time. Like I always say, I could be wrong, but my impression of the difference between people of my generation and say people like uh, older generation, to name people who are really the, the masters of the world right now, the 55 to 70 year old, the guy who are doing all the big buildings and so on, I think they always saw the computers as what this toy can do for me. And I think people in my generation is more like, almost like, what can I do for you? So there's a shift of power in the relationship that keeps changing. And I think that is very time, generation, species specific. I don't think there is a generational thing where they came to the ambition to produce architecture in a particular way. But I think the way to do you relate with the technology and the techniques <coughs> and fashion and everything on your time, it, it's kind of uh, almost impossible to, to avoid. Like, I'm pretty savvy with computers, but right now, all the guys in my office and most of the guys in the schools, after a while, they're all faster and better than me with the software, even though I know the software quite well, but I don't spend 100% of my time in front of the computer anymore. So the guys who are 25, they blew me away <coughs> with the computer, and the guys who are 18, were blown away the why I'm 25, and I don't think there is a way around that. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that make you better. Uh, I think it just makes the variables more complex. And I think that is why schools like this are so critical in the discussion because you need to figure out what what is the role of that in the production. And because the truth is, yes, any idiot can produce something that looks good with the computer, right? For sure. That doesn't mean that it will be good. Um, and that for me is one, it's the most dangerous thing about this time. Like I hear all the time with young guys and working in big offices, they yeah, I did that project. You did that project? Well, I modeled the computer. Well, no, you didn't do it. Somebody else did. Like thinking still matters. So techniques and those things is a big jump. And it changed the way that we think of it, but it's not the only thing. So for me, I think places like this, which for my money is one of the, the one of the two schools that matters in Europe. The rest is crap um, because they're looking back all the time and trying to look forward. Um, but I think to keep rethinking that and to rethink what is the role of the things is extremely important because 
I don't think we can fight that. It's like fight you. You know, when you're 40, your body doesn't do the same thing as when you're 20. And there's no way around. You can go to the gym as, the gym as much as you can. You can be as vegetarian as you can. But then there's chemicals that help you, technology help you. Viagra will keep you going later in your life. And it will change certain things, but there are other things that doesn't change. So I, I love technology, but you always have to be like a critical, suspicious attitude towards. Because remember in the 80s, in the mid 80s, when visual effects became very heavy in movies and in music, well, the Pesh Mall is only the only band that still matters at that time. Remember Erasure? I mean, they were as big as the Pesh Mall at that time, but who gives a fuck about them? Except in certain gay clubs in Hong Kong. The Pesh Mall is still matters. My point is, it is good and bad. So what do you do with that? It's the same with movies. Like The Matrix and Star Wars came at the same time, and The Matrix became a seminal movie because they, they use the visual effects in a very clever way. Star Wars was just stupid. So actually, Star Wars was way more powerful in terms of pure technology. So you have to keep thinking. Good. Thank you for having me.